So today's video is about reviews and reviewers. Mostly this will be aimed at mainstream outlets and other larger publications, but a lot of this discussion will also heavily apply to many independent YouTube reviewers as well, and other gaming commentators in the industry that offer up informative videos or articles about different games with the intent on dispersing information to potential buyers. It's no secret that there has been an element of skepticism aimed at mainstream gaming news companies for, well, for years now, and I can't even count the number of times I come across someone vocalizing their belief that these outlets are paid flat out for their promotions and their scores, that they are biased and in bed with large publishers in order to promote certain games regardless of quality and sell them to a larger audience. This is not quite accurate, but it's also not completely wrong. In a very literal sense, no, these publications do not receive monetary compensation for their specific review scores, and if they did, they would be required to disclose that information by law. However, what is not discussed is private access being used as compensation, and how that payment does not need to be disclosed. The discrepancies between user score and critic score on review sites like Metacritic are unbelievably skewed. Oftentimes, mainstream games will have a critic score that is nearly double or even triple the amount of their user ratings, and this is extremely widespread. And furthermore, there are very few examples of consumer ratings and critic ratings actually aligning at all, or worse yet, even being close to one another. There are examples of the scores being similar. The best case I could find is the new Spider-Man game with an 87 from the critics and an 8.7 from users. Exactly synced, and obviously a perfect correlation is not going to always be the case, but scores like Battlefield 5's 73 versus the user score of 2, or Artifact with a 75 from the critics and a 2.1 from users. I could go on for hours. There is an overwhelming majority of examples that have skewed score sheets where critics rate the game so far far above what average consumers do, it's no longer dismissible. Though these review sites like IGN, Game Informer, or GameSpot are not paid directly, what they do receive is special privileged access, and behind the scenes advantages in order to continue covering games first with preview copies, special interviews, and other material that forces the gaming community to still tune in since that material is unlikely to be made available anywhere else. On the one hand, this is not a literal currency payment, but on the other, the access equates to viewership, or clicks, which converts directly to a pay check, and privileged access to information is absolutely valuable. When reviewing games, which are a form of artwork to be sure, developers and publishers do not enjoy overly harsh criticism. Who would, in fact? If given feedback from two different sources, and one says, your game is steaming garbage, and the other says, your game is amazing and I love you for it, which one do you think elicits a better response? They may, in fact, be equally valuable in terms of articulation and legitimate feedback encompassed in the material, but one, the positive one, almost always opens the door for further dialogue, since the positivity likely helped sell more copies and made everyone feel good, and the other, the negative one, most likely likely closes those doors. Leveling criticism at a game usually results in viewers coming away less likely to purchase the product, and depending on tone, it can offend those that worked on the project, even if that criticism was entirely accurate and came from a place of genuine concern over a game's future with the intent to help it improve. Since mainstream outlets and many independent creators wish to build bridges, they must adjust their reviews. Instead of saying what they may in fact actually believe, or what the game truly deserves, they temper the language. Instead of saying, it's terrible, they say, I was moderately disappointed. And soon after that, it turns into, it's not what I was expecting. Before eventually, even when a game is a total travesty, their language becomes so convoluted and inaccurate because of their desire to maintain insider connections that they rate a game that is why widely regarded as an absolute failure as an 8, and they praise it constantly. Artifact is a great example, also a very recent example, but there are many more beyond this. The game's trailer? Nothing but disappointment and dislike. The game's player base? Down over 97% since launch only a couple of months ago. User scores? 2.1 on average, but mainstream outlets? glowingly positive praise with lines like high level of computerization helps take what could be an incomprehensible game and make it manageable showing a smart level of design and playing to the strengths of the platform what what does that even mean that's literally just the process of turning a card game into a computer game the same thing could be said about practically any strategic tabletop computer game conversion 
In the background right now, I'm playing some footage of a games journalist playing Cuphead. This footage is fairly old, but even so, it sparked up the age-old debate of do game reviewers need to be good at the games that they play? Some say yes, others say no. If a journalist is thorough enough and articulate enough, they may be able to do a review of a game while being absolutely terrible at it, sure. But the flip side is that a player so unskilled that they cannot even beat the tutorial, let alone the game itself, would not run into the same problems that an average player would, and thus, cannot write a valuable review because their experience is so atypical. Combine that with the fact that mainstream outlets are avoiding inflammatory rhetoric and sidestepping harsh criticism entirely because it risks the loss of connections which allow them the ability to prep reviews and interviews well before they are made public, and you have a recipe that can only lead to one thing, inaccurate and useless reviews. In the past, I have criticized the entirety of mainstream gaming news media, but with that blanket criticism and the research entailed in producing my own content, I have discovered that the mass generalization is not in fact fully accurate. Branching away from reviews, we see a journalist like Jason Schreier from Kotaku. I've had very harsh things to say about certain pieces that he's written, and I by no means agree with all of his work, but using insider connections to publish informative material about corporate decision making, about game timelines and various other industries related news segments bent on informing readers but not with the direct result of swaying their purchasing patterns, that's valuable gaming journalism. On the flip side though, creating reviews and other informational posts about game quality that are completely divorced from actual user experience is damaging and only helps perpetuate a downward slide in the industry norms. This problem also persists well past large mainstream outlets and infects the independent creator ecosystem as well. Opportunities are granted in their overwhelming majority to creators that praise releases and are viewed as safe or reliable to bring into the fold. Companies cannot risk disclosing privileged information to sources that they deem to be unreliable. Of course, that's normal. But beyond that, they also exist with the all-encompassing goal of raising their profit margins. So not only must they avoid sources which they deem to be untrustworthy, they must also avoid creators or sources they deem to be unreliable from a profit perspective. Because giving out privileged access to someone who turns around and says, this game is bad, seriously, it's not worth your money, that cannot happen. What's the result? of all of this? Well, the result is that advanced information is dispersed to outlets and sources that companies know for a fact will say positive things. And the understanding is that by receiving this privileged material, you must say positive or at the very least neutral things in order to maintain that connection. I used to receive fragments of access of this exact type in the past. That is no longer the case. I have become too risky, too negative, and completely refused to limit myself to only voicing positive praise when a game encompasses both good and bad characteristics. Combine that with my focus on directly combating microtransactions and loot boxes, which are present in nearly every single AAA release nowadays, and it's the perfect combination of factors leading me to be on the do not contact list for most likely all major publishers. This isn't a complaint. This isn't a woe is me segment. I made my bed intentionally. Now I sleep in it. It's recognition of the fact that even if I wanted to, I would not be allowed to participate in the behind closed doors community of insiders. Now, all of this may seem like it doesn't really matter all that much, it's just the rantings and ravings of another classic YouTuber, but it does matter, because the review process is increasingly disconnected from actual consumer norms. Massive sites that give players a one-stop snapshot of whether or not they would purchase a game will often have pre-release reviews that are glowingly positive before the game has even come out before user reviews are even possible, and as we've seen, with such a wide chasm between average critic reviews and average consumer reviews, that means potential players are getting a horribly skewed vision of the future. To be quite clear, I think Resident Evil 2 is a very good game. I'm not taking shots at that game in particular, it's just an example of the insider critic reviews being up well in advance of the game's actual launch, which tilts the scales undeniably. Since critic reviews and user reviews are now so wildly different, seeing as critic reviews are often based on maintaining connections and are no longer rooted in the desire to give accurate and consumer-friendly info, it comes as no surprise that one of the biggest concerns with the new Epic Games Launcher is the availability of public user feedback. Whether or not they add a system for this in the future, right now it's a concern because on Steam, reading user reviews is a large part of the buying process for many different gamers. And with that stripped away, it means there is a higher emphasis on mainstream and creator reviews, which are not always born of the correct perspective. 
Overall, the degradation of industry practices on a AAA level is accentuated by the downward spiral of the corporate review structure. Insiders help provide limited and skewed knowledge of products that may be underwhelming on release, but the sales numbers, due to these deceptive market conditions, reinforce that behavior as lucrative. All combined, it creates a growing schism between player expectations, consumer reality, and projected quality as a result of marketing and insider access. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I am the best source because I'm blacklisted by this publisher and that publisher, therefore I'm saying what's true and blah blah blah. In fact, my language is combative to an unproductive extent almost always. But be very careful about what reviewers you trust and which sites you frequent, because if those sources have been shipped hundreds of dollars in merchandise recently, or flown out to private meet and greets as the game launches with developers, they will absolutely be impacted by that if they wish to keep that source of opportunity flowing because in order to keep those doors open it requires them to be reliable safe and profit friendly which does not always align with consumer and average player interests anyways that's about it basically to sum up the title gaming reviews have turned into propaganda that often no longer represents what is best for players but yeah i'll end it there there's not much more to say if you want to support the channel, check out the links down below. We have new esports merchandise with your custom name, gamer tag, number, plus some other stuff like a Facebook group for active gamers, a Discord server, and our own gaming forums for people to join and discuss. But that's it. I'll cut it there and I'll stop rambling. As always, thank you for watching and have a nice night.